Hello, my name is Bill Hearn and for the past four years I've been working with David Gleave researching for a book called Football's Black Pioneers. And we've learned so much during that period that we really want to share it with others, particularly young people, because we found uh, that there's a lot of forgotten history and a lot of unbelievable history, because can anyone really imagine a day when there were no black players whatsoever in the English Football League? And in the early days there weren't. And then there were a few, and the few that were suffered horrible abuse and they got no protection whatsoever. So I want to talk about three of those early black players, Walter Tull, Jack Leslie and um, Viv Anderson. And I also want to talk about a couple of examples of how you should never give up um, an example where a sporting superstar family uh, came from a, a family that were almost certainly enslaved in Jamaica in the, um, in the 19th century. And also an, an Irish potato farmer who left Ireland because of the famine, came to England, and amazingly enough is the great, great, great grandfather of a very famous black footballer. So it just shows what a small place the world is when an Irish potato farmer can uh, be responsible for a, a very great black footballer. So early days of football, 1888 in the first division, there wasn't a single black player. So the very first season, no black players whatsoever. In fact, it was 1895 before the first black player played in the first division. It was a goalkeeper called Arthur Wharton, who played for Sheffield United. He only played one game, uh, but he did play in the second division for Rotherham Town. And he is a very famous figure in black history. And there's a statue to him at the England headquarters at Burton. So he's certainly not forgotten, although he was forgotten for quite a long time. But I want to move on to another fairly famous name, Walter Tull. Walter Tull made his debut for Tottenham Hotspur in 1909. It was actually Spurs' first game ever in the, in the Football League. And even though 1909 is 14 years on from Arthur Wharton, Walter was still only the fifth black player to play in the Football League. And he was a, a decent player. His father was a beige and his mum was white. And um, he, he played at Bristol City one game and he suffered horrible abuse. I mean, it really was excessive even by the standards of those days. And it's felt that the, the Tottenham board, although they were supportive of Tull, they were a bit embarrassed by this because, you know, how, this was probably going to happen every time Walter Tull played. So they, they let him join Northampton and in 1911 he played for Northampton and, and did very, very well there. He's, he's, he's a very, very good player in Northampton's history. Uh, but 1914, obviously, World War I broke out and uh, along with many, many other people, Walter enlisted straight away, joined the army, went to France and fought. And in those days, black people were not allowed to be officers in the army. You had to be of strict European descent. And yet Walter broke that barrier and he became an officer. Sadly, he was killed in, uh, in action in 1918. Uh, so never resumed his football career, obviously. But he goes down as a, as a massive figure in black history and certainly a hero as well, giving his life for his country. Just want to move on a little bit past World War I to a man called Jack Leslie. Now, Jack isn't as well known as Arthur or Walter, although he might be one day soon. He, um, he played for Plymouth Argyle, quite a lowly team in Division 3 South of, of the English League. And in 1925, he got picked for England. And the papers were full of it the next day. You know, Jack Leslie was in the England squad. He was a travelling reserve to go to Ireland. And his colour was mentioned as well. In, in those days, they used the term colour. So the newspapers would say an interesting selection, the coloured man, Jack Leslie, is in the team. So there couldn't really be much doubt about the colour of his skin. And yet two or three, three weeks later, when the squad went to Ireland for the match, Jack wasn't with them. And he'd clearly been dropped. And nobody knows quite why. The theory is that the selectors discovered he was black. And on discovering he was black, he immediately dropped him. Now, that's not impossible, because in those days there wasn't television. There probably weren't the colour photographs in newspapers. And a lot of the selectors, because the team was chosen by a selection panel, would have been based in the north. So it's not inconceivable that most, if not all, of the selection panel had never seen Jack Leslie play. However, I think that's unlikely. 
because there was a Southwest representative on the, uh, on the panel and he'd been in position for about 14 years. So it's hard to believe that he couldn't have known what colour Jack Leslie was. So I have a theory that the selection committee got leaned on and somebody superior to the committee probably said, hang on a minute, we cannot have black people representing England. And I wonder whether that was the government. I've got no proof of that whatsoever. But clearly something happened for Jack Leslie to be dropped from that team. He was fit. He wasn't suspended because he played for Plymouth on the same day as the international game and he scored two goals. So who knows what happened? But they've overcame all of that and became the first black player to play for the full England squad, uh, England team in 1978 and went on to great things. I mean, he won another 30 caps, scored two goals, won European Cups and so on. And he led the way for other black players um, last October 2020. Reese James became the 100th black player to play for the England full team. So clearly he, uh, you know, he was very, very much uh, a trailblazer. I asked Viv what life was like for a normal black player playing in the 1970s and he repeated what many of the other players that we interviewed said that it was routinely they would be having monkey noises made against them, fruit would be thrown at them and Viv tells a story of one game where he went out to warm up and he was getting pelted with fruit, it really was awful and he came in and he said look boss I don't want to play, I really, really can't put up with this. They're pelting me with fruit, they're making monkey noises. Uh, I, I can't do it. And the manager said, well, you're going to have to because if you don't play, I'm just going to play someone else. So I said to him, what would have happened if you'd walked off? And, and he was incredulous. He said, if I walked off, I would have been looking for a job, another job on Monday. You know, they got no support whatsoever. So to hear that huge advance forward now, that um, at least if somebody did suffer that sort of racist abuse, the team could walk off and be fully expected to be supported by the, the relevant football associations. Um, but just to show that the footballers aren't the only heroes, I just wanted to mention Viv's parents, because Viv's parents came across from Jamaica and Viv's mum, Myrtle, was a school teacher in Jamaica. And when she came to Nottingham, she went to get a job as a school teacher. And she was told that her qualifications weren't recognised in England. She'd have to go away and perhaps become a dinner lady. So Myrtle did that. She became a dinner lady. She then went on to become a nurse. And it's the classic sort of Windrush generation where people come across with very, very little. They aren't made particularly welcome, but they work their way up. They bring a family up. And in Viv's case, you know, it, it came to, uh, to fruition. Viv had a great career. And is now still a you know a great man in uh, you know in terms of diplomacy, football, and and so on. So you know credit to people like Myr Myrtle and her husband Audley for what they did, and and they're not alone. I mean most of these black players that uh, came through did so because their their parents were brave, made big decisions, moved across here, and made a, a new life for themselves. Which leads me on really to the uh, the two stories I mentioned earlier. Um, one family was based in a, a plantation called Mullet Hall in Jamaica. It's a man called John Chamberlain. Now, if John Chamberlain wasn't an enslaved person, his parents probably were. So imagine the feeling of helplessness. And I mean, an enslaved person hasn't just got a dreadful life. There's also the knowledge that his children are going to be enslaved, his children's children are going to be enslaved uh, if, if something didn't change. And luckily, something did change for John Chamberlain. Slavery was abolished during his lifetime. And John went on to have a son called Moses. And Moses had a son called Evan. And this is sort of leading us into the early 20th century. Evan and his wife, Mabel, had a very tough life. They couldn't read or write. In one three-week period in 1921, they lost two children, one three-year-old, one 19 months old with fever, and whooping cough respectively. And Evan and Mabel's son Cecil decided to move to England and, and, and he went to Stoke, uh, which is quite an unusual place to go. I mean, most of the, uh, the West Indians went to Birmingham, London and so on, but Cecil chose Stoke. He married a, another Jamaican lady, Anastasia Bell, and they had children, um, Mark Chamberlain and Neville, Neville Chamberlain. 
Neville went on to have a, a very, very good career. He played for Newport County, Portfield, Stoke City and a few others. But Mark went even further. Mark went on to play for England. And more so, Mark's son, Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, is still playing for England. So I just find it absolutely incredible that if John Chamberlain came back here after 200 years, he would look around and think, I can't believe this. I mean, he, he wouldn't know football existed, he wouldn't know television existed, but to see that his descendants are equal to white people and probably live in a house as grand as the plantation house, I mean, it really, really just shows what, uh, what is possible. And, um, you know, nobody should ever give up. And a, a similar example is, Patrick Cavana. Patrick was a potato farmer in Ireland in the mid 1850s and there was a famine and he had to make a big decision what was he going to do so he decided to move to the northeast of England and when he was in the northeast he, um, he had another son also called Patrick and we, we found that Patrick when he was only 13 he was working as a labourer down the mine in, in Northumberland and as he grew he moved down to Teesside and he met a lady, got married, um, had, a, had a child, and that child married, um, and so on. So as this Irish branch of the family are developing a life in Middlesbrough, in Sierra Leone, there's another family doing likewise. And eventually, Albert Kamara came across to Teesside in 1949, married Irene Livingston, and as a result, Chris Kamara, the famous footballer, manager, TV personality, was born on Christmas Day, 1957. So again, I put myself in Patrick Kavanagh's position in the 1840s, 50s. What would he think if he came back and realized what, what that little move had achieved much further down the road? And how amazed would he have been to find out that one of his descendants was black? Because Patrick had probably never seen a black person when he was in Ireland in, in, the, uh, in the 19th century. There were black people there, but probably not where he was in, in, in rural Ireland. So, you know, just two examples of where almost small miracles, how lives had turned around. And, uh, you know, and I think hopefully if we get this message across to young people that life was once like that and players were once abused, abuse and it was just routine um, the terminology used was dreadful any black player would be referred to as at best darky in in the press um, so you know it, it's, it's it's a good reminder to young people that things haven't always been as they are now uh, could they imagine their football team without any of their black stars um, so you know we want to just get that message across and spread the word that you know, we've come a long, long way, but we need to make sure we don't go backwards because they were the bad old days. When we started writing this book in 2016, the problem of racism in football seemed to have been getting better. Things sadly have gone backwards over the past four years. And I've spoken to several players about this. And what they told me is that it had never gone away, really. Racism was always there. It was always underlying. Uh, so we've got to make sure that we don't regress in, in, the, in the way that I fear. Um, and one area where we, we must do much, much better is in black managers and black coaches. And that came up in virtually every interview I did. Um, the black footballers would bemoan the lack of black managers in football. Uh, it's a, entirely illogical how you can have so many black footballers, but then that progression isn't made to management or coaching and certainly Viv Anderson who wrote the forward to the book um, in 1993 he became manager of Barnsley and he was one of two managers two black managers in the football league at that time and he thought this is the beginning you know there were going to be more and more and more and yet 27 years later it hasn't got any better and I've asked what the problem was some players say that um, they don't even bother applying for jobs because they can't see the point. They know they won't get the job. The other thing often put forward is people recruit in their own image and owners of football clubs tend to be white. So they're perhaps more comfortable in selecting a, a white manager. 
certainly they seem to prefer the safety, as it were, of a, of a proven failed white manager than taking a chance with a, a black manager. So, you know, lots of theories, but certainly there are a lot of black players out there who are desperate to get into management and still haven't been given that opportunity. The, the Rooney rule is often quoted and everybody thinks the Rooney rule is a good idea where when a job is advertised and the interview, there's got to be at least one applicant from a, a, a minority. Uh, but obviously that won't work if it's only lip service. So still a lot of work to be done in making that breakthrough to the, the management level.